Uh, we're going to be listening to Courtney Stewart today presenting on his topic. Uh, Courtney uh, used to count brine shrimp on the Great Salt Lake and measure fish on strawberry, uh, but he decided to become a middle and high school science and math teacher for the money. Right. He currently is a member of the Teal Department as an instructional leadership faculty. Uh, when not studying rural school leaders in the remote areas of Utah, he studies experiential outdoor education and online learning environments. Prior to USU, he was faculty at University of Montana and Minnesota State University Mankato uh, within their educational leadership departments. He now lives in North Logan with his wife and four kids. I'll give the floor to Courtney. Okay, so I'm gonna talk louder so they can adjust their mics, but I'm excited to be with you today. Um, I was telling these guys that I don't like to stand here. I feel like, you know, that's King Kong and I'm the, the little lady that's being carried around. So I'm gonna kind of stand up here uh, so I feel like I can get close to you and we can be afraid of King Kong together. But my name is Courtney Stewart, as Travis said, and I'm in the instructional leadership group. Uh, but today I'm gonna be sharing with you something that I've been working on, uh, specifically with a lot of help from Travis. So it's kind of fitting that he's here with me today as I talk about this. But um, I'm going to be sharing a specific class that I've been working on. But before we do that, uh, I'm going to show you, this is not my uh, desk in my office. This is a lot cleaner than my desk in my office. Um, but this is just figuratively showing you how I worked around uh, this need that I had in my class. But before I start, I wanted to get to know you. And rather than having you go around and introduce yourselves, which is always you know, kind of awkward and takes a lot of time, we only have 35 minutes today, um, I want to use kind of a, an online participation uh, software. So I need you, if you have a device, smartphone, tablet, uh, computer, I want you to go to Kahoot, it, well, it's actually Kahoot.it. And this is going to be just a, a little quick survey so that we can get to know you and I can get some uh, feedback from you of what you'd like to get out of this today. So what you do is you go to kahoot.it, so the little window up there, and you'll enter this PIN, so 985450, and then it'll ask you for uh, a nickname. And so go ahead and join that, and then we'll start this in a second. Yeah, there should be blue zone, is there should be a guest one, or... discussions, it's great for surveys, it's great for quiz, even with online or even with lectures. And you can get real-time instant feedback from your students. So I'm using it as a survey today. It's free. Yeah. All right, here we go. We're going to start. So we have four questions. Okay, and you'll have 30 seconds to answer. Where are you from? And unfortunately, it only gave me four options to pick from, so I had to do the, the four coordinates. North, south, east, west. Ten more seconds. Oh, there we go. Oh, everyone's from the west. 
Okay, that's good to know. So if I, if I break out in Utah vernacular, you'll understand me. Because I'm fixing to tell you a lot today. Okay, so how long have you been in education? Could be either. I'll leave that up to you. A lot of people go to school for seven years, right? What are they called? Doctors. Okay, so we got a pretty good distribution here. We've got some on the upper end. We've got some, a lot of zero to fives. That's good. And then in between. Nice. Good to know. Okay, let's go to our second, our third question. So this one's your mode of delivery of your instruction. So which mode are most of your classes delivered? Oh, we got everybody. Oh, okay, so most of you are online. There's a couple there that are blended and a few face-to-face. -face. Oh, no one took me up on class. Who goes to class? All right, last one. What would you like to learn most from today? in. Let's see. Canvas tools and learning styles. Okay. One class adoption. Oh, there's some three honest people that just want to be entertained. That's good. Okay. So I'll try to dedicate quite a bit to the Canvas tool as well. Um, so thank you for doing that. Let's go back to our presentation here. Okay, so Kahoot, it's kind of fun. It, I, I have used it a couple times. My students like to use it in my classes too. So is anyone a superhero fan? I am, big superhero fan. Yes, thank you. Every superhero has an origin story, right? So I wanted to share my origin story for this class. So I teach a class, um, you can see here, Teal 6280. It's a master's level pre-service principal class. It's a graduate class for teachers that want to become principals. So the topic is instructional strategies for diverse learners. Now it doesn't necessarily mean uh, diversity in the sense of ethnicity, but in the different ways that students learn. So the intention of the class is really to help teachers that are going to be principals, when they get into that role of being a principal, how they can help all of their teachers help all of their students. That convoluted enough? Yeah, plenty. But the, I taught this class online, both fall and then spring terms, and they were asynchronous online. We met a couple times through Adobe Connect, maybe three times throughout the course, but it was purely online. So these are students that are working in Vernal, St. George, Salt Lake, uh, all over the state, even some in Idaho and Wyoming. And so I thought I was doing a great job. I put my PowerPoint on there, I had a video, I had great fun little assignments. Um, for, I had two semesters of data, and I was like, this is great, everything's doing well. Well, uh, come to find out, I, and you'll have an option today to look at Canvalytics, and it's a learning analytics tool that takes a look at all of the thing that's happening on your Canvas course. It looks at clicks, it looks at time, it looks at duration, number of people that viewed a PowerPoint. Well, I dug into that, and I wanted to look how my students were do doing. So I had a class of 18. I looked at the PowerPoints. Um, so I got eight views on that PowerPoint, eight out of 18. Would you celebrate that? That's 40%. Well, I kept digging. Four of those were the same person. So I had four people that were viewing my PowerPoint out of 18. What percentage is that? That's 20% of my students were actually looking at the PowerPoint. Now, why weren't they? Why weren't they digging into that? I had made, spent all this great time making this great PowerPoint. They weren't into it. So I had to reevaluate how I wanted to teach this class. So I came up with a plan. And my plan was, this class is about instructional strategies for the diverse learner. 
Was I taking that into consideration as I was delivering this course? No, I was teaching to the same person, one person, same way. So I wanted to model this class content through the course. I thought that'd be great, you know, kill two flies with one swat. Um, I also wanted it to be student-centered. Why do students elect to take online classes? What do you guys think? Flexibility, okay. What was that? Access, Access yeah. Time constraints? They're employed, they're busy during the day. It's all about them, right? Uh, what's that phrase? Um, you can get it how you want it, or you know, like your sandwich at Subway or something. Um, online is now based on you, on your preferences. Who listens to Pandora? Yeah, it learns our preferences. It learns our styles. That's why we like Pandora. It plays stuff that we've liked or disliked. There's these learning al algorithms that tell us or help us and present new things. School of One, has anyone heard of the School of One? School of One is same. It tailors the daily instruction based on the performance of the student the day before. That's pretty unique. So I wanted it to be student-centered and also student-directed. And there's a lot of literature out there, especially um, School of New York, a guy named Garekis, Steve Garekis, has done some research that's found that self-directed improves the learning experience. Not necessarily generates higher scores, but it improves the learning experience. So I took all these and I made a plan. I have this idea that I want to do. So luckily, I applied for an innovation grant through RCDE, which is now just regional campus. Um, but it gave me some funds and some assistance to create this new course. And so I went to City, and they gave me the tools to really help succeed in implementing this. So let's talk about the design. So the, the kind of the thing that I wanted to start with is to determine what are the students' preferred learning styles. Well, I don't have a chance to meet with them and to talk to them and to give them assessments. So I needed a tool that would have helped me from the get-go. And so that took me to the VARC. Has anyone heard of the VARC? One, okay. So let's look it up. So the VARC is actually an acronym. The V-A-R-K stands for four different learning styles. And you can go to this website, VARC-learn.com. It looks like this. Uh, that's their, the homepage. It's actually a researcher out of New Zealand, and he's been doing this since 1995. Okay? And so he's identified visual, aural, read, write, and kinesthetic as the four major types of learning for adults. Now, he's kind of generalized a lot of this, but he's done a lot of research. If you see up there, there's a questionnaire. See, questionnaire. And anyone can take that. It's free, and it gives immediate results. You could take that now if you wanted to click on it. Um, but that's what I decided to use as a way to begin my class. So these are the four different types of learning styles or modalities as they use. So there's the visual learner, which you can guess is images, diagrams, visualizations, auditory, it's through the listening, spoken, um, narration, read-write, obviously reading and writing, and then the last one is kinesthetic. That's more of a hands-on approach. That's more learning by doing um, and putting things together and that type of thing. So I took these four. Which would you think is your preferred modality? Just by raise of hand, how many would say you're visual? One, two, maybe three, four. What about auditory or aural, as they call it? Not many. Read, write? About a quarter of you. And then kinesthetic? Yeah, a lot of kinesthetic learners. And it's interesting, and I'll show you some data here later on, of the scores where students rated themselves and what this tells you. And even you can be multimodality. You can be really high in both. So if you had the chance to take this, is anyone taking it right now? Oh, you're such good students. You're listening to me. You can. You can go back and you can take it. I don't think we'll take the time to do it. Um, but you'll be surprised at what your results come out and show you. And I want you to think about it. If you do take it later on, do you agree with those results as you read through those modalities? Now, feel free if you have questions. Please, I, I love questions, and I love to answer them because then I don't feel like I'm lecturing. So, All right, so I had the VARC. That was my pre-assessment that was going to tailor their instruction to them. So what does that require of me? If I, yeah, to teach in all four modalities. So what does that mean? 
I get to create four different classes, right? You're like, what, are you crazy? Yeah, I was crazy, but luckily I had some help. So I came up with this idea that I wanted each student to be able to learn in a certain path. So they picked that modality, and they would stay in that modality throughout the duration of the course. And now I came up with some other ideas to change that, but that's overall the idea, is that I wanted them to have a tailored instruction. You go into Canvas and you start doing that, you end up building four different assignments, four different deliveries. And so when they go to submit an assignment or a quiz, what are they going to have? They're going to have three blanks. They're going to have three zeros. So that created a problem. So I went to City and Kenneth and Travis. They came up with this brilliant idea. And I want to show you what it looks like in Canvas. So here's my course. They would come here. They would go to the Start button. And I would talk a video that showed them overview, tell them the, the different learning styles. They would go and they would have to take the quiz. This is their very first quiz. It's a questionnaire, it was non-graded, um, but they had to enter their scores in here that would tell them their modality. And this is the first module. So knowing their score and being warned that there's gonna be different ways of learning, I present them here and there's a video that talks them through it of choosing the path. But you can see right here, there's four different paths that they can choose. So when they would come to this module, there would be no content showing until they clicked or chose a path. So if they clicked on kinesthetic, let's go to kinesthetic. This is what would show up as their delivery. Now remember kinesthetic, what type of learner is kinesthetic? Interactive, hands-on, okay, kind of figure it out on their own. That was my hardest one of coming up with, uh, let's just say that one. But see, here on this one, um, for this week's strategies presented in chapter two, please research online in your school or in another text. And I give them all these strategies that I want them to research. And so um, I, the, the topic this week, there was humor, pacing, physical activity, and I gave them prompts to go out and discover. Um, and then they would then submit their results in doing that. So that's what the modality would look like. Yeah. Uh-huh. This idea of, um, you know, Howard Gardner's stuff on multiple, multiple intelligence and all that, all that stuff. And there's actually quite a bit of research out there that say this doesn't really exist. Yeah. I'm wondering um, if you're going to talk about differentiating your instruction in any way, do you expose students to researchers who are saying, who are really debunking this idea that and this is extremely pervasive in public ed mm -hmm. um, to show them that it's really not so much about their learning style but the content and how it's how that content is best learned right. and he there's several videos of, of some different professors you know just saying if I'm gonna learn about maps it's not gonna be auditory right yeah. so um, I'm just wondering if that flows into this because one of the things I do is like, you know, lot, they're all tied into this. And then I say, well, what about if it really doesn't exist? And mm -hmm. there are researchers. So I'm just wondering if you kind of dissect it and take it apart in this course. Yeah, so in this course, we ex I expose them to a lot of different learning styles. We talk about differentiation. We talk about Howard Gardner. We talk about Bloom's taxonomy. We talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and this is K-12. And so this is geared towards the K-12 student. And one thing that I've encouraged them is that it's not one size fits all, one, one size fits all but it's also not, you're not stuck in your own learning style. Sam Wang out of Princeton has actually said that you, you don't learn best in your own learning style. And so what I try to encourage is that it optimizes the learning experience. And that's what I stated with the Gorekis research is that it optimizes the learning outcome, not necessarily performance on the outcome. And so, but that's a great point because there's a lot of evidence that shows it. Adam, take the VARC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what she was saying is basically based on their content, having it a, a approached in the appropriate way to deliver that content. And that's, that's exactly right. If we're, if we're teaching math or we're teaching maps, yeah, you definitely don't want to um, do a auditory. Yeah. Yes? 
um, is that there's a little book that I ran across years ago, and it's called How We Learn and Why We Don't. And it was by a mother-daughter team. I can't remember their names. But they talked about using that same idea of recognizing your own style, but then recognizing that there's instructors that have a different style, mm -hmm. and how you work with that. Yeah. And I'll try to remember the names and get that to you. Great. Yeah, and that's a great point, is my preferred learning style when I teach that way, I assume that everyone's learning that way. And so it's, it's also that Jahari window, what I know about me and how I deliver the course. Lewis? So I, what I hear you were saying was in reference to the work of like Peschler from UC San Diego, who has completely debunked learning styles, saying there's no scientific evidence mm -hmm. at all for that. Yeah. And then, or Lynn Waterhouse, who has debunked multiple intelligence is saying there's no scientific evidence for that or you know some, the Dale pyramid in here that there's no scientific evidence for these and yet they're wildly popular within education but if you read Research and Reason from Stanovich he's saying don't use those for those reasons but do pay attention to the evidence-based practices associated with them. And so it's an interesting walk between the evidence-based practices that are embedded within those that do work, but the motivation behind them may not be sound. So that's how I reconcile some of that. Differentiating that content, if you're trying to teach something, you know, right. it, if it lends itself best to hands-on, then use that piece. But yeah. anyway, I was just... Yeah, let me show you It was you more with your content than what you were going over, so I'm, I'm just no, sorry. No, that's but a I great just, point. I think if it's a graduate-level course, you have to say, mm -hmm. you always have to like be critical, critically thinking of those and say, who's saying this doesn't exist and who says it yeah. does exist? So that was really... The one going. thing that Thank you. I try to emphasize in this class is also the use of formative assessments. We are constantly monitoring students to get feedback whether that was a successful delivery or not. Um, and I even do that and model it in this class. Let me show you. Um, so they would come and get this content, and so this is their assignment. This would be their assessment. And I would match their content and their assessment to be very similar, that they would present their feedback to me in the same modality as they would receive it. So if they were kinesthetic, they had to present a project back to me, project-based learning or problem-based learning. If it was read-write, they would write to me. If it was visual, they would upload a video or a diagram or a chart. Um, so I tried to use that as a formative tool to see if that assisted them. But I also, let me skip ahead. I use these formative quizzes. So at the end of every module, I would give them 10 questions, and they had to pass with an 80%. If they didn't pass these questions, I encouraged them to go back and relearn it in a different modality. So this gave them the option to re-experience the learning. If their one they selected wasn't successful in assisting them. So that's where I try to uh, help them identify an optimal learning path, even for the content of that week. So that was Canvas, <clears throat> and that's how I ended up building and using the learning path. And there's a lot of potential in the learning path, and this was just in my class alone, but having a tailored instruction that you could choose on, this is all based on cookies. So you know those cookies things, like we accept cookies, or I clear all my cookies. So if you'd come and click that, it remembered that when you came back and visited it. So if you wanted to switch, it would reset your cookies, and then you'd have to reselect again. So that's the nitty-gritty back behind it. But So I wanted to know what students would think. As a tenure-track professor, I, I get evaluated with my classes, and so I have to document you know, student performance or student you know, perceptions of my class. And so I wanted to know how the students would receive this type of learning. So let me show you some of the results we have. So the first one is just my overall. Uh, this was just the average. And it was out of, I think it's out of 70. Is it out of 70? And so we're really shooting for that gray area on that band, if you know IDEA or the IDEA evaluations, that it's the middle 50%. And I was there. Uh, my first two semesters, I was there, 50, 51. Those are good. Uh, they're acceptable. Um, and, you know, and today in the keynote, she said the same thing. It's good. We, I can celebrate that. I was doing a decent job. But when I implemented uh, this learning pass, it jumped by 10 points. And so I was 
they were excited. They enjoyed it. And a couple of the qualitative comments. I love the fact that I could learn in my style. And a lot of them had never had an online class where they could choose the way that they received the instruction. So it was new to them. And then this is another quote. I absolutely love the way the class was taught. I've never had a class where I've learned so much because the professor took the time to get to know our learning styles. This is an online class. I never met with them face to face. I wouldn't probably recognize the student if I saw him in the hallway. Um, but this is a, a comment that almost sounds like a face to face meeting. And so I, I'm, you know, I'm still working through that data and the results that they have. Um, one other piece of data is this use of Canvalytics. Five minutes. Um, and you can actually go and see this today. She's actually going to be showing it. Megan down in the Juniper Lounge is showing Canvalytics and how you can take your Canvas courses and break it down into this. This is every student that took the class, their VARC score, and what modality they stayed with throughout the, the, the semester. And so you can see some stayed with their modality most of the time. Some would change. I encourage them to try every modality at least once. You can see not all of them did that. So questions, how could you use uh, these learning paths in your classroom? I use it in the classroom to see when they're online. So if there's a time period that I know and can expect that they're going to have questions, I also look to see in th within the first two weeks who has been accessing the class and oh, what yeah. they've been doing and, and how far they progressed. And then I, if they are not moving along or they might need a prod, then I'll send a personal message to them nice. and, and make sure that they're moving forward. And if they have any questions about the technology, then I, help to, I try to help them. That's awesome. Real time, applicable to them. Um, we've been brainstorming, Travis and Kenneth and I, of how this could be used in multiple classes. And one idea was some of our classes are cross-listed um, and may have different experiences, different background knowledge. And the student could then choose their, essentially their class, the content that they want to receive in that class. You could tailor it to graduate level. We have a master's doctoral class combined. And we teach essentially two different classes within the same listing. Well, if they came in and selected doctoral, they would then be provided everything within the doctoral dis delivery. So there's a lot of potential with the Learning Pass tool, and it allows some flexibility. But essentially, for me, it allowed some interaction. It increased my student engagement. I looked at the PowerPoint views and the time watch, and it skyrocketed. There, the fidelity is a lot higher there. And so that was what I was see seeking for. The master's level classes, these, these are all teachers that are doing phenomenal jobs, and they all get, end up getting mostly A's in these classes anyway, because they're so A-driven. Um, so I couldn't look at grades as an outcome, but I looked at their engagement and participation and their feedback, and that was encouraging for me. So I'm still working on it, still finalizing, but yes? For undergraduate, have I tried it in undergraduate? Actually, no. I haven't. Uh, Travis is actually using it this year in a couple undergraduate courses, so he, he will be. Um, I unfortunately don't teach any undergrad classes, so. Sorry. Or was it just the assignment that was different? Because um, essentially, if you did a different modality, you would be doing four different. Classes. Exactly. That's a lot of time to well, put in it to was one the same class. Content. It was the same content, but delivered differently. So here's the visual. So if they had selected the visual for that week, they would receive their content here. Um, so you can see it would be a video. And this is not just a video of TED Talks. It was me talking through and diagramming and breaking down the content in that way. So essentially, yeah, I prepared four different classes. Um, in the audio, I had a podcast. I made a podcast of that week's content. They could listen on the go. They could download it. They could listen to it here. It was only audio. They didn't see anything. Um, same with read write. Um, I had written things out. I had a PowerPoint where they could read through the PowerPoint. Um, in the TED Talks that I highlight, I actually got the transcripts, and they could read through the transcripts. So it did. It took a substantial amount of time, um, but I'm hoping that cost, that net cost that uh, Cynthia talked about, will yield better results for me. I believe it was in the podcast. 
when you did the video on the podcast, did you do two separate things or did you actually just do the video and break out the audio? That's a great point. And the first time I tried it, I tried to do two separate and it was taking too long. Yeah. It was like four yeah. hours. So what I did is I had an audio recording everything I did and then I could go in and chop up what I wanted for the audio podcast, add stuff or take out stuff. So that's a great strategy that I used to simplify it so I didn't have to create four different things every time. Thanks for coming today. If you ever want to give me ideas or feedback or um, like help or sh I'll show you what I've done, please be uh, in contact with me. My email is courtney.stewart at usu.edu. Thanks for coming today, guys.